What's the word, y'all? Y'all know me as the internet general manager, so the off-season slash free agency is one of my favorite parts of the entire year. It started off slow, but a lot of the big dominoes have fallen. Paul George is a 76er. Somehow, Klay Thompson's gonna be on a different team. I just can't even compute that. My I cannot wrap my brain around that. Um, and a lot of the people got paid. So today we're going to be looking at some of the bigger signings that have happened so far, give them a grade and kind of talking through it. Starting off, of course, with Paul George. So I don't know if this has changed, but Paul George decided to sign his contract or agreed to his contract at 2.31. So Paul George decided to sign his contract at 2.31 a.m. Uh, typical Paul George fashion. The last time Paul George switched teams, it was also at like 2 something a.m. this time. <laughs> but this, uh, with the 76ers, a four-year, $212 million contract to go to the 76ers. Um, the 76ers are rumored to be one of the few teams that were willing to give him a full four-year max, and he was looking for his last big payday. Um, the 76ers also brought back Drummond on two years, 10 million. They brought back Kelly Oubre. Uh, they brought back Tyrese Maxey on a max contract and then signed Eric Gordon on a minimum, and that's their offseason so far, and they still got some roster spots to fill, so it's not a complete grade of their offseason, but so far, I'm enjoying it. Now, I've made this comparison before years ago, and I don't even remember what player I was referring to a couple years back. But this is something that happens a lot in baseball. So just, just bear with me. In baseball, you will see a player sign a contract that is 10 years long, right? A 10-year loan contract, an 8-year loan contract, where everybody and their grandma know that the second half slash the last couple of years of that contract, the player might not be worth the contract that you're paying them, but you're not paying him for eight years from now. Ten years from now, you're paying him for the right now, and that's the way I feel about this 76er uh, Paul George contract. Because in four years, Paul George is going to be 38 years old, and there's no way that he's going to be worth $50 million by the time he's 38. But you bite that bullet four years from now to get the player that he is today. When you think about all the teams that he was interested in, he told the, the Clippers that he wasn't coming back because they didn't want to give him the money. Uh, he was rumored to potentially want to go to the Orlando Magic. Maybe he used them as leverage. But he was like, I'm going to a team with a bunch of money, whether you like it or not. And the 76ers, is my, it was my number one spot for Paul George because it allows him to kind of be this third fiddle after trying to be the second fiddle over the greater part of his career and, and basically failing to get that championship. Now he could play alongside Joel Embiid and he could play alongside Tyrese Maxey and, and let that be it. So I'm kind of looking at this with Paul George slash this iteration of the 76ers is like this two-year window maybe even even a three-year window for them to finally get that Larry O'Brien trophy I mentioned when the 76ers got eliminated in the playoffs that this next stretch might be the last chance you get with Joel Embiid and his star power as he's hitting 30 years old to potentially go out and do it and they had all of this money and if you ask me they're using it the right way even if that means that you're overpaying for Paul George at the end of his career the fit is seamless though the fit is as good as a fit you could get for Paul George. Like, all the other options where they've been going back to the Clippers, that, that window had closed last year. It was over. You couldn't convince me, even if you went back to the Clippers, that, oh, they could do it this year. Nope, the window had completely closed. You think about the Orlando Magic. That's a young, upcoming team. But I don't know if Orlando Magic signed Paul George. And I started looking at Paul George last year, Orlando Magic, as this team that's going to win the Eastern Conference. He goes over to Philly, and you really have to have the conversations, at least as of right now, between the Boston Celtics, the Philadelphia 76, and the New York Knicks. And I guess the Bucks. The Bucks haven't done anything just yet. They said they want to change their roster around, but they're in that conversation, right? And adding Paul George is, is perfect for that. I mean, the big caveat or the big thing about it is obviously, can they stay healthy knowing the history of Joel Embiid and also knowing the history of Paul George? Last year, for the greater part of the season, Paul George was an all-NBA caliber player before his injuries. So this is just adding another piece, and I I love it. It still allows Tyrese Maxey to be him. One of my things I was a little bit afraid of for the 76ers is going to get a guy that's going to not neutralize Tyrese Maxey, but make it more difficult for him to be the best version of himself. And Paul George is one of the most portable players in the history of basketball, where you can put him on almost any team. He's not going to hurt you. He's always going to play his game, and his game is catch and shoot, whether my boy Stephen A. Smith believes so or not. He could create for himself. He could create for others, and again, the defense is still pretty Pretty good at 34 years old so I like it I love that Kelly Oubre is back after the year that he gave them I was sad to see Nicholas Batum switch back to the Clippers but it made sense because when he got traded to the 76ers there was rumors that he was going to force his retirement because he wanted to be in LA for the rest of his career so he goes back there and we haven't heard news on Kyle Lowry I would love to see him back in Philly but all things are important for me to grading the 76ers as one of the winners of free agency. Even if, again, that means that at the end of Paul George's contract, it's a bad deal. But you're trying to compete with the Boston's and the New York 
Knicks of the world, and you have to go out there and pay some players to do it. Let's talk about a move that we that we liked. Um, Catavius Caldwell Pope gets a big old bag. Shout out to Kenny Pope. Three years, $66 million with a, a player option on the last year for the Orlando Magic. The Orlando Magic are one of the young up-and-coming teams of basketball, of course, being a playoff team. I think the five seed going into the season. And the main question for them is, can they ever learn how to shoot or acquire some people that can? Kenny Pope has been a 40, uh, like four years in a row of him shooting 40% from three. Now, obviously, he's not going to have the same playmaking and playing with Nikola Jokic or Jamal Murray and stuff like that. But he's still a guy that I believe could come in and catch and shoot for the foreseeable future. Three years and a bunch of bunch of money for him. I really like this signing considering the circumstances. They did this deal before Paul George and it made a lot of us think that, okay, Paul George is definitely not going to Orlando Magic. So let's pivot. Let's go get a guy because I think Gary Harris might not be on the roster. So you're looking at Jalen Suggs, KCP, Franz Wagner, Paolo Bencaro, and Wendell Carter. I did see some rumors that they might be looking at another center. They still got some money, but I, I like that five and they continue to grow together. And with KCP being a guy that has won two different championships, he's one of those vets that you desperately need in the locker room when you're a young up and coming team. And they paid him a big old bag, but there's no reason not to do that considering where they are in their cap where you haven't been able, you haven't needed to extend Franz yet, Jalen Suggs yet, or Paolo just yet. So you can afford to give him $66 million, even if it's a little bit more than what KCP might be worth right now. Good old pickup. I got to keep checking my phone because things are still breaking as we go. You feel me? It's still breaking. But KCP, I like that signing a lot. We already mentioned this. Drummond going back to the 76ers. This is dope for Drummond. Uh, it sucks for the Bulls who turned down uh, multiple second round picks at the deadline. We just let, let him walk in free agency. But hell, I liked one of my favorite Drummond seasons is when he was backing up Joel Embiid. So he goes back there and I think he's one of the better backup centers in basketball. It's just kind of hidden because the Bulls suck. Uh, so you couldn't really see it. Uh, but my my next, the next thing we talk about is my favorite move of the entire offseason. I'm biased, but because of this man, Chris Paul. But Chris Paul ended up getting waived by the Golden State Warriors. And I, I'm going to do a full podcast episode with, with my boy, um, who I don't want to spoil, just in case his, his um, timeline mixes up or his schedule mixes up. But the, the right as of right now, as of right now, the Golden State Warriors are one of the biggest losers of the offseason. Who knows what happens? I think there's rumors that Larry Marketing could be coming th via trade. But this is just not the way you run a team. But but, but whatever, whatever. Mike Dunleavy, it's not looking good so far. So they waive him because they didn't like any of the trade offers that they were offered. And one of the trade offers they got that was uh, put to their table was like Zach Levine and stuff for Wiggins and then Chris Paul. They said, nah, Zach Levine's contract is too big. We'd rather waive Chris Paul. And Chris Paul went out and signed with the Spurs. I think it was one year, 11 million. I can double check that, but I think it's like one year, 11 million. I can't even find the graphic. Just, just know he's a Spur. Chris Paul's a Spur. And I will say this, I absolutely love it. That Chris Paul was at this crossroads, right? Last year was not a great year. His, his jump shot has been falling off over the last couple of years. Struggled to stay healthy. I mean, he's 39 years old, for God's sakes. And the Warriors experiment wasn't great. It was one of the few times in Steph Curry's career, though, where his team had a positive net rating when he was off the court, which was dope. And a lot of that is Chris Paul coming off the bench. But regardless, it didn't really work out. And he was at this crossroads, right, where, like, I can go chase. I could go to the Lakers. I could go to the Clippers, potentially, on, like, a minimum. Or I could go to the Spurs, one of the cool, fun, up-and-coming teams that has a unicorn on it. And I can try to spend the last year of my career, potentially, helping Victor Wibanyama reach his potential. And I absolutely love that for him, man. Um, I, I've been watching a bunch of Spurs, obviously, last season with Wimby being there. But now I might not miss the Spurs game for the entire year. With Chris Paul being my favorite player of all time and him being 39 and me watching these last couple of years not go great. This could potentially be the last year of his career. He'll never say that because he's going to try to play until he can't no more. But I, I love it as a signing because Lord knows that boy Wimby had too many possessions this season where his guards did not get that man the ball. And Chris Paul, one thing he going to do is he going to set you up. So it's my favorite thing. Obviously, it doesn't raise the ceiling for the Spurs to be a championship contender. But having him on their roster where he can help mentor Stephon Castle for at least a season and help Wimby get a full, like a real experience. Because one thing you can say about Chris Paul, even his old age, that brother can still pass the ball like crazy. So um, that was my favorite move. And again, I'm biased, but still, I love it for him. Maybe the most random move of the free agency period. Uh, Jonas Valanciunas, three years, $30 million to go to watch the Wizards. I saw a lot of people that are in the know about the draft stuff say, hey, it's kind of a cool parent to have Alex Sarr and Jonas Valanciunas. But as a guy that has not watched a lot of Alex Sarr, I can't really comment. Uh, I was just curious about Val, Val because I thought his market was going to be uh, not ideal. And I guess three years, 30 million kind of fits that. I mean, that's not a lot of money for a, a start. Like Val and Shunas has been a starter center his entire, entire career. And the game is kind of evolving in, in front of him 
where his type of center, this big bruiser, not an amazing rim protector type of center is kind of going out of the way. But hey, you get three years, 30 million, and then maybe that can recoup some of your value. My one question is why did you sign three years and not like two, right? So you can get back on the market and, and your prime again. And three years from now, Val would be, let's see, three years from now, Val and Achunas will be 35 years old. I mean, this this thirty million dollar contract might be the last bigger deal of his of his life. So maybe it does make sense to get a three year deal. Also, on his basketball reference, it says his nickname is Big Science. Where did where did that come from? I have never heard him called Big Science. We might have to start doing that on this channel. Um, but yeah, I, I just think the league is evolving around him, and he's going to Washington for three years, and maybe he gets traded halfway through that contract. Regardless, that's a vow. I didn't know what was going to happen. Um, and yeah, he's going to DC. What? Why did Woj's picture come out with two total pixels? <laughs> uh, free agent Klay Thompson plans to join the Dallas Mavericks on a three-year, $50 million deal with a player option. Thompson ends his historic Warriors run as part of a... Mo uh, Josh, Josh Green is going to Charlotte, and this is very low-key. I think Charlotte's having a pretty good offseason where they brought in Reggie Jackson and two second-round picks, and then they're bringing in two second-round picks to bring in Josh Green. Like... When, when you're a team that know you're probably not going to go out there and spend money in free agency, acquiring players other teams don't want, whether it be because they're trying to stay under the second apron or whatever and getting draft capital in return, it's the way you do it. I also like their coach and signing. So, like, collectively, I think the Hornets get a thumbs up for me from this offseason so far. But Klay Thompson, this is just so hard to wrap my, my brain around because, in my mind, th th these guys, Draymond, Steph Curry, and Klay Thompson, is going to play together forever. Um, but no, it didn't happen. Uh, he's going to Dallas. And Dallas also picked up Zeke, uh, I almost said Zeke Najee, Najee Marshall. And they also brought in, um, I am drawing a blank right now. Who else did they bring in? I mean, they lost Derrick Jones Jr., which is unfortunate, but he got paid by the Clippers. Shout out to our boy Derrick Jones Jr. Quentin Grimes. Oh my God. It took me so long to get there. I, I did have a, a procedure this morning, so my brain is still not working. Um, but they, Quentin Grimes, Najee Marshall, Clay Thompson is their free agent. Of course, they lost Tim Hardaway Jr. They lost Josh Green and they lost Derrick Jones Jr. Okay, so that's that's their offseason so far. Um, it's again, it just feels weird to eventually see Klay Thompson in a different jersey. I'm wishing him nothing but the best. Um, he goes to Texas um, in, in, instead of going to LA because of the tax reasons, and and ultimately he wants to go out there and win another championship. And the Dallas, Maver Dallas Mavericks obviously was the team that went out there and, w and went to the finals. Um, and Klay Thompson. With, with Luka Doncic as the lead primary like creator is very interesting. I think he's going to get a bunch of shots, generate a bunch of shots. I, I worry a little bit about their defense, right? With uh, Derrick Jones Jr. being gone, who was their main point of attack offender, defender. And like defense is so much more than that POA defender. But right now they don't really have that because Klay Thompson hasn't been the best defensive player. Najee Marshall is a really good defender, but you're not starting Najee Marshall, right? The start lineup is going to be Luka Kyrie, Klay Thompson, PJ, and then Lively or Gafford, hopefully Lively. Um, so it's not like they completely, completely lost on that side of the ball, but it, I'm just curious to see who's going to step up and be that guy. Could it be Klay Thompson doing it again? I don't know after all of those surgeries and his legs and his knees and stuff. I'm not completely sure. But as far as accumulating talent, they obviously have had a talent increase from their championship run, which I think is is a win. Like, I know everybody makes the jokes about Klay Thompson 0 for 10 in the playing game, whatever, whatever. But second half of the season, Klay Thompson averaged like 18 points per game. He was back to shooting over 40% from three. He looked closer to Klay Thompson on the offensive side, not necessarily on the defensive side. And if he continues that momentum, because remember, the man had missed a lot of basketball over the last three to four years or so. If he continues that momentum, this contract is going to look like pennies uh, compared to what his production can really, really be. It's a, it's a steal of a contract for the Dallas Mavericks. It's just whether or not we, which version of Klay Thompson we eventually end up seeing. But Klay Thompson has had the luxury over his career of playing with Steph Curry, and that allowed him to generate so many open looks because he had this magnet, this defensive magnet, and Steph Curry, who no team wanted to see leave open, and that left Klay Thompson open, even though he might be, what, the third, fourth best shooter, maybe second best shooter in the history of basketball. Um, and now with him playing alongside Luka and Kyrie Irving, he might get even better looks, which is crazy to think about. Uh, so shout out to Klay Thompson and the Dallas Mavericks for making this happen. Of course, it cost you Josh Green, but I think that's something you feel good about. I think you do that 100% of the time. The Warriors, man, the Warriors, the Warriors, the Warriors are just missing out. Missed out on Paul George. Klay Thompson goes for, for nothing as of right now. Again, it's supposed to be a sign and trade. 
the things haven't really broke to see exactly what they get back, but I'm assuming it's not going to be nothing too spectacular. And if they don't go out there, go get a Larry Marketing or whatever, whatever, they, they probably are going to have to panic and go get a Zach Levine. Like, real talk. They might have to. Or maybe I'm just <laughs> trying to get that too. Uh, but I think, again, I'm going to make an entire video about multiple teams this offseason. I'm going to do a whole podcast episode where I go deeper into it. Because, yeah, I don't love the way the Warriors are being ran right now. Steph Curry is on the roster with a bunch of yucks. You know what I'm saying? No disrespect. They did get DeAnthony Melton on the team, which is cool. But you have Steph Curry. You want to build a contender. That team is nowhere near a contender at this moment in time. But, again, we got to wait to see how the offseason plays. We got to wait how the offseason plays. But I'm, I am, I am, I hate their offseason so far. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. But it's not over. We're only a couple days into it. Who knows? They may can swing and do something. Tobias Harris went back to Detroit. Uh, two years, $52 million. Hey, listen, there's um, there's a, a salary floor. They had to hit it. They had to hit it. And everybody knew Tobias Harris was going back to Detroit for the last four months and it's done. It was the max contract. And I think Pistons fans could be happy about that. Tobias is a good player. I know he was very, very disappointed for the 76 especially towards the end of that tenure. But compared to what's on the roster, it's a good player. It's a good pickup. It's not something you care about too much if you're not a Detroit Pistons fan. And hell, some Pistons fans might not care about it either. But Tobias Harris can provide something. And lastly, the best deal of the entire offseason is the bull side and uh, Jalen Smith. Three years, $27 million, baby. We're up, we up, we up. Um, we are up. <laughs> no, Jalen Smith, if you remember, every year, is other than last year and this year, I guess, I did these streams, right? I've done these streams of like the, the draft class. And Jalen Smith coming out of college was one of my favorite players in this class. Not that I think he was going to be a superstar. I don't think that was written on the wall. But I thought he was going to be a guy that would have a long, successful NBA career. He ended up in, um, drafted to the Suns, didn't work out. He ended up with the Pacers. He averaged 10 points per game in like 18 minutes per game last year. And now he's with the Bulls, and he is 24 years old. And the Bulls, again, this is me. Maybe it's Cope, whatever. But the Bulls are putting together this young core. We have um, Josh, Josh Giddy, Kobe White, Matis Buzelis, uh, Ayo Desumu, Patrick Williams, um, uh, Dalen Terry, Julian Phillips, some of these guys, y'all like, who? And then now Jalen Smith. That's eight guys, 24 or younger, on the team. Um, so the rebuild is in full effect, which is dope. I, I love that we have Jalen Smith on the team. Good rebounder, great shooter. And I think that the Bull, I'm curious because this is definitely, definitely, definitely not the Billy Donovan way, but let's let's assume that DeMar DeRozan goes to Los Angeles to be a Laker, and we're going to talk about that in a second, and then maybe we can find a team to take boost. If it's, I don't really know. This young team could be a, a up and running, like fast-paced team, and that's not been the case in any Bulls tenure, whether it been when they were really good under Tom Thibodeau, or we went to the Del Negro, or we went to... You know what I'm saying? Um, just and we never really had an up tempo team, but with like Josh Giddy and Kobe White and uh, Buzelas and like they have a lot of people who could get out there and run. And I'm excited to see if that's what the identity of the Bulls turn into. Jalen Smith could be a swing and a miss. I don't know, but if it's three years, 27 million is worth to try at 24 years old. And I've been talking to some Pistons fan or Pacers fans since it happened, and they're like, "You gonna love him? I already loved him before he was a Bull. So now that he's here, I'm excited about it." And the last thing about the Lakers, so far they've struck out on everybody. And it's like, okay, what do we do? Because LeBron James said, for the not for the first time in his career, but his first time for a long time, LeBron James like, hey, I'm willing to take a pay cut if that means we can make some moves around the edges. Boom. Paul George is available. We might be able to get Paul George. No, that don't work out. Boom. Klay Thompson is available. LeBron James calls Klay Thompson himself, said, hey, brother, you want to come to Los Angeles? I've never had a shooter like you in the entirety of my life. You want to come here? He like, no, the, pro the taxes in LA are OD. So I'm going to go to Texas where there's no state tax. And then they continue to strike out, strike out, strike out. Well, the last big domino is DeMar DeRozan, who grew up a Lakers fan, who wanted to sign with the Lakers before he was a part of the Bulls. And because DeMar doesn't really have a market, you might be able to get him for the mid-love exception. I don't like the fit at all. I will say that right now. If I'm the Lakers, I wouldn't do it. But you have to try to do something because teams around you are getting better. Dallas, OKC, I haven't talked about. Hold on. Dallas, OKC, the list goes on and on. These teams are getting better and better and better around you. And you've been a playing team for the last couple seasons. You can't just be like, we're running the back because Max Christie has a real deal now. You can't do it like that. Like you have to make some type of decision and maybe just a talent pool with DeMar DeRozan makes sense. I don't think so, but it might end up happening. Another team I've hated their offseason so far. Um, the Denver Nuggets, teams around them are just getting better. They're getting lost. And maybe they end up with Brody, which will be interesting to see him in Denver. But for the most part, they're losing players. They lost Bruce Brown at the championship run. Now they're losing KCP. Uh, KCP's a guy that's going to be hard to, to replicate. 
Um, you think about Christian Brown. Christian Brown shot a better in this uh, last year of his NBA career, but he doesn't have the volume or the percentage that KCP provided. So they just have to try to figure it out again as other teams around them end up getting better. OKC was phenomenal so far in this offseason. Brought back Isaiah Joe. Brought back uh, Aaron Wiggins on team-friendly deals. And they went out and signed Isaiah Hardenstein three years, $87 million. And it sucks if you're a Knicks fan. I Hart had built this identity there. Um, when he was phenomenal over the last two seasons or so, when Jalen Brunson and him signed with the Knicks, I've said this story before, but I'll say it again. When him and Jalen Brunson both signed with the Knicks, I was more excited about Isaiah Hardenstein because I had no idea that Jalen Brunson was going to turn into what he did. Um, I've been a huge Hardenstein fan since Denver um, and him getting his money. I'm happy for him. And it makes sense for OKC to go out and pay him. Like when they signed Wiggins and they signed Joe, the questions on the timeline were like, does the time of this mean that they're not in on Isaiah Hardenstein? Then boom, it hit three years, $87 million. I'm curious to see what the starting lineup looks like, looks like out there. Because they could just move everybody up and start both of these bigs together because both of them are kind of seamless. I like Chet Holmgren as a five, though. But, like, Isaiah Hardenstein can run some four. Um, does it mean that, like, Alice Caruso just come off the bench and give you 25 minutes of the greatest defense of all time? I don't know. But those are good problems. And the way they've run their offseason so far, I'm very far away from this right now as we're day one of free agency. But the moves that they've made have making me feel more and more comfortable about feeling like they might be my preseason Western Conference Finals winner. Like, again, a lot of things have to happen. I'm sure there's probably some big trades for some teams out there that might change my mind. But as of today... I kind of feel that way about OKC. Uh, they they showed that they're good enough in the playoffs this year. Obviously, they ended up losing in the second round. But, like, that's their first bit of playoff experience. And I thought they did a pretty damn job, good job of, like, defending Luka. They obviously couldn't defend P.J. Washington in that series. But, like, I like their offseason a ton so far. And with players getting better, Kaysen Wallace is going to get better. Shea is working out with Canada. I saw a clip today where he had back-to-back threes. I say, hold on. Hold on. Uh, but they have all the recipe to go out there and be a championship contender. So I think that's it for the offseason right now. Again, we're going to keep things updated. I'm going to look at my phone and uh, yep, yep, not, nothing's broke. So we'll leave it right there, man. If you enjoy, leave it a like, subscribe. Let me know what you think about the free agency period so far.